All the narrative. And All then, the narrative. So typical Arsenal. We don't know what to do. We're just like headless chickens just running around. A little gay part. Da, fully. Not little. <laughs> fully. Don't talk shit about <laughs> ever. I would never. The Please. I would never. Please. Do that. I think the corner gave her a smelling salt to wake her up. No. <laughs> <laughs> is that racist that you don't know who wants that? That is not racist. Maybe sexist. Not racist. But. Oh, I I get I see what you're getting at. Yeah. A couple of historical games in the IPL this past week. We'll start with the Kolkata Knight Riders as they beat the Rajasthan Royals by two wickets. Um, we had Kolkata batting first and they hit 223 runs of uh 109 comes from Sunil Narayan. I just have to say that I've loved this move from Kolkata when they push Narayan up the order. Maybe three or four years ago, I just think he's super entertaining. If he makes 10 runs or 100 runs, it's always fun. He'll just stand lefty and he'll smash runs. And then Rinku carry them a little I bit at the end. I saw a tweet that said, he's the worst best batsman. <laughs> pretty appropriate. All he comes, he, as soon as he comes to the crease, he's just swinging, not moving his feet. No fucks given at all. Just breaks the spirit of a bowler who's trying to bowl, think really hard about how to bowl to him. And he's just swinging, and edging, he's, going for four, going for six. And he's so casual about it, especially in the power play. That's why it's a genius move, right? Exactly. Because there's only two feelers outside. You connect maximum, anything. Maximum Yeah, risk. you avoid these guys. But this time he actually faced 56 balls, which is actually turned out even better for KKR hitting 223. 100. <laughs> but they still didn't win. Exactly, which made this... One of the best games of the season yeah, so far. Yeah, and Josh Butler, 107 out of 60. I remember we were watching parts of the game together yesterday. Yes. And I said, after the fifth wicket, yeah, let's not talk about this game because it's going to be a one-sided shit show <laughs> for KKR. And then I shut my and TV. And then, yeah, I was going home and then I turned it back on because Neil was watching. And I'm like, dude, what the fuck just happened? <laughs> Butler's hit 107. And then Robin Powell hit a few runs and stuff like that. But at the last over, it was nine, nine needed out of six. First ball goes for six. And then the next three balls are dot balls. Because Butler didn't want to run with Avish Khan on the other side. Yeah. So he, And then three dot balls. And then he took a double and a single. And he was dead. This was the first game he's actually performed mm -hmm. in the IPL this season. He's been historically brilliant in the IPL. But this was the first um, game he's truly performed. So Did, Is that true? I think he scored 100 before this season. No, no, no. no. I don't think this season. Not no, this no. season? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely not this season. I know he was having some trouble with his yeah. form. Okay. But just to put into perspective, the records broken in this yeah. game were uh, Butler brought up his seventh IPL century hmm. and his third in a successful run chase. This is the most by any batter. Yeah. Um, Rajasthan Royals chased down the joint highest score in the IPL, hmm. registered the maximum runs in the last six overs of a successful chase. So just... Overall, a very dominant batting performance by Rajasthan Royals. Um, and I have some winners from the game that I would like to highlight. Well, one winner, which is the West Indies national team. Fuck Butler, fuck Rajasthan Royals, fuck all the records that they broke. Um, chasing this absolute, absolute behemoth of a total. Sunil Narayan, 109 and 56 balls mm -hmm. at a strike rate of 195. But he also took two wickets and only conceded around 7.5 runs per over. Which is crazy when the other teams had hit 224. Exactly, obviously. exactly. And I had no clue that this guy retired from his national team. And he's just been touring the world playing franchise cricket like some DJ, DJ Diesel. Um, and three days ago, because of his good performance, he was asked if he will be returning to the Windies team. And in his... Really casual attitude. He's like, nah, I'll be watching it from home. And then three days later, which is last night, he strolls into Eden Gardens and puts up possibly the best all-round T20 performance this entire T20 history has ever seen. Mm -hmm. um, so now the world is at his feet. Come back, come back, play for Wendy's, play in the T20 World Cup. I'd love to see him again back then. Yeah, obviously, everyone would love to see him. And the West Indies need players like this. Exactly. They're struggling a little bit internationally, especially but Test and ODI, but 2020, 2020 they're fine. 2020 is the one place where they shine. <laughs> it's because, unfortunately, they're not play paying their players, right? Yeah. Like, West Indies is 
players are not playing the playing for the national team as much since these T Twenty leagues have started all around the world, right? You were talking about Narayan, but also there's Puran. There's a few other guys. Pollard historically only played Twenty Twenties for West Indies and stuff like that. So that I think is because of financial reasons, honestly, because they're going to play in New York, they play in Mumbai and Punjab and all these. Why teams. should they go and play? For exactly them? in one month, what they make in the IPL, yeah. it'll take them four years to make it with their <laughs> national team, and that is. A little more for the West Indies, but also accurate for other teams as well. Because mm-hmm. I saw some of the numbers in 2023. If Ishan Kishan is making 15 crores for one month in the IPL, I mean that's insane. Yeah. He shouldn't work another day in his life. One month before, during the IPL, that's it. Then chill. Especially in India, it's more competitive and everything. And that's what I'm assuming it is with Sunil Narayan, who we were talking about, was so good and has been so good. Hasn't played for a national team. That's the reason. And now the national team is like back at his feet, begging him to come back and play. So he said three days ago, I'll be watching it from my home. And then last night uh, after the game, they asked him again. And he's like, it is what it is. We'll see what the future holds. And I'm like, this guy, imagine how good you have to be to treat this entire relationship with your country like a situation ship almost. You have to be as good as MS Dhoni. Thala for a reason. Thala for a reason. Very good point. But honestly, Dhoni should make a comeback. We are very weak at our wicket keeping spot. Um, I think he'll outperform most of those. Not players. Dinesh Karthik. Not Dinesh Not Karthik. Dinesh Not Dinesh Karthik. That's In a World Cup, yeah. <laughs> but um, so I was saying about Narayan, it's actually, I think he'll play if they do an impact player. <laughs> <laughs> so for him, the impact player would be you back. And then anyways, they're sitting. And then you only bowl for your followers, no fielding also. So that's the addition. And they can do it because the World Cup is in America, West Indies and in that region. Or we should just give him an Indian passport. Do you remember that rumor when Chris Gale was playing really well for RCB? Hmm. I totally believed it. I was like 13, 14 at the time. I was smarter. I'm usually susceptible to these rumors, especially the ones that make me happy and confirm all my biases. Um, So I went around telling all my friends that, yeah, West Indies are in shamble and tomorrow I think Chris Gale might just start playing for India and we might just win the T20 World Cup. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that would have helped. I mean, we've signed him for a million ads of Pan Supari and all, but never for the Indian national team. <laughs> uh, okay, moving on. Um, I want to highlight some losers from the game. Okay. These the West Indian team was the winner. Yeah. The losers, in my opinion, is Shreya Sayar. I think this dude has the easiest job in the IPL and everyone should aspire to be like (laughs) make all the big bucks, no responsibilities, no consequences, no pressure. This guy made 11 of 7 in the last game. That's good for him. That's good for him. That's good for him. And he has a nice smile so it's good for him. Uh, In the tournament he scored a total of 140 runs with a high score of 39 not out and a very very bad strike rate of 122. And despite this tinker that he's putting up, he's gone absolutely under the radar because of the likes of Sunil Narayan and Mitchell Stark, who's just robbing this country dry, getting paid 24 (laughs) crores for this absolute abysmal performance that he's been putting up. And then in the game, we also learned that he's not actually captaining the side. It's Gambir who's pulling the strings from from the outside, telling him, give the last over to Arun Chakravarti. And everyone is crediting him for promoting Sunil Narayan up, um, up the order and not actually Shreya Sayar. So, I don't know what his plan is. Is he trying to make it into the T20 squad? Is he not? I mean, it's going to be difficult anyway with Pant coming in. Jokes aside and... I mean, there's so oh, many so good Pala's batsmen. Not playing. No, he's not. Oh, playing. Okay. I don't know. I don't know. He might just pad up and start walking and then that's how we'll find out. I mean, they might just get yeah. way more views than like a Zimbabwe or Pakistan <laughs> game. If, I'm... if Gambhir has anything to say, Dhoni's not playing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you got that. Yo, Graj. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, fair enough. We've highlighted the good and the bad uh, historical game. We'll move on to another one. We had um, Bangalore, the historically terrible team in the IPL, take on Sunrisers Hyderabad. Hyderabad bats first and it's 287 and 20 overs. <laughs> Not enough. Yeah, I mean, I don't know, children are bowling against them in this fucking <laughs> Bangalore side. Do but you think, do you think, do you think they should field 11 batsmen in the next game? 
Do you, I think they might have a better chance of conceding fewer runs and then going out there and actually chasing it too. I mean, if Kohli bowls four overs, that's a great thing anyway. I, imagine the names that come out of it. He's a great bowler. He's a he great person. A, he is a great He's person. the king. I know you're joking, but he is a great person. I love him. So, don't don't mock me. Don't mock the king. <laughs> but yeah, the 11 bowlers could be. I think it'll be the same result. <laughs> they aren't that bad. <laughs> it'll be 350 on. against 340, basically. So then, either way... More maximums, more views. That's true. Think about it. It's, it's a all business. about the money. It's all about the money. So then, Bangalore actually 262. And Dinesh Karthik, as he historically has, outperforms himself every time there's a T20 World Cup coming up. And he had 83 out of 35 balls, which is absurd. And uh, Hyderabad, I will say, Travis had hit a century in 40 balls, 39 balls when he took what he took to get a century. And he just comes in India and fucks everyone, like he did in the World Cup final. He smashed us all around the place. We were struggling to bat in the World Cup final, if you guys remember. And he just comes and destroys. He destroyed Mumbai in his debut game in the IPL, and then this game also he goes off. This is the second time Hyderabad has broken. The all-time IPL record for most runs. That was set by RCB a few years ago, which was 261, which is absurd in 20 overs. They hit 277 against Mumbai and then 287. Only 10 more against that shitty RCB. (laughs) (laughs) But yeah, what do you have for us, Sammy Stats? Uh, Sammy Stats is that, um, so like you said, 287 by the Sunrisers is the second highest total in the history of T20 cricket, not just IPL, after Nepal, who scored 314. Who did they score it against? I remember uh, seeing Mongolia. That. I didn't even know Mongolia had a cricket I team. I didn't know Mongolia as a country. Oh my god. <laughs> 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 they are They are very much and they yeah. are one of our important cricket playing nations. Okay, have some okay, respect. Okay. Okay. You're so, trying to so. grow the game over here. You're insulting all these countries. Um, then they also made a record for the most maximums um, by a team in the IPL, eclipsing the 11-year record of 21 hit by that RCB team against Hmm. Pune Warriors in Bangalore in 2013. So maximums are sixes? Maximums are sixes. So they have the maximum maximums. Yes. Um, But so this game kind of brought back the age-old debate uh, within the cricket discourse and on X, formerly known as Twitter. Uh, that the balance between the ball and the bat should be restored and it's kind of disappeared over the past 10-15 years with the introduction of T20 cricket. And although I agree with that, that it should be restored, there should be more um, of a equality between the bat and the ball, mm. these kind of games are just so much fun to watch. They sell. They sell. Every ball is going out of the park. Batsmen are finding new ways to obliterate the field, find new gaps, just Sky doing his crazy stuff yesterday, obviously Head doing his crazy stuff. Karthik also hitting so many shots behind him. Behind him. Um, Just the creativity is insane to see. So, although I agree, these games kind of just reaffirm my belief that batting is king. And I guess that's what's always going to attract the viewers. Also, who would want to become a bowler? Yeah. You're getting smashed all over the park in a T20 game. You have a... Um, your economy of like 20 runs, 17 runs. If you're, should, if you're an RCB bowler. If you're an RCB. A, a batsman would be less. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But you're right. I mean, the game has strayed away from, you know, the traditional test match stuff. And that's why countries like America are picking up 2020, they're doing their own leagues, Dubai, UAE, wherever these games are being played. It's just T20 cricket. And because it's so entertaining, it's so short. It is tedious to watch a test match. I mean, we really enjoy the sport, so we can watch a test, a full ODI also. But 2020, I mean, if my mom is asking me who's winning and all, it can be annoying, but if she cares, I guess that's something. That's something, yeah, Yeah. exactly. So the winners from this... um, game and heads overall performance and everything were humans everywhere because who doesn't like some good head (laughs) pat cummins was another winner he's slowly becoming my favorite cricketer in the world um how dare you he's trolling the fuck out of indians on his ig stories 
uh, posting all when it, all his content from the World Cup. Um, and then there was also this vid video where he's telling his players, um, I keep saying, and you, you will hear from us all the time, that is how we want to play. It's not going to work every game, but I can tell you, everyone is terrified when they come up against us. And we've got to blow some teams out of the water before they have even walked out on the field. I hear that and I'm like, I want to run through a brick wall for you, man. I'm going to do anything for you. Like, like I want to play for you. Get me, sign me up. I'll be the ball boy if you want me to. And he's just taken this basketball philosophy from the British and applied it in the most correct fashion and used some of his brains. And it's just working for SRH at the moment. It's yeah, selling. it is working. Yeah. At least entertainment wise, it's working. Exactly. So basically what you're saying is he says his game plan is stick to the plan, don't stray. Don't stray and let's just blow them out of the park. Cool. Let's just go on the counter attack all the time, all out, guns blazing. What Ben Stokes and Brendan McCullum have spoken about in their press conferences about basketball. And how they execute it so well. And yeah, how they execute it so well. <laughs> in a Ex test match. And exactly. All. So this, this gives some evidence that basketball can work, but <clears throat> not in a test setting. Maybe in a T20 setting where it's a shorter format conditions are not changing that much. I just had a thought. Imagine if they had Travis Head and Sunil Narayan opening. Who? Like any team. Oh. <laughs> India, we're getting all these players. <laughs> but imagine just two players who just stick to that strategy that just we just make as many runs as we want. Yeah. And then try to defend it. However, it's worked so far in this IPL at least. But that's like, that's what's crazy about T20 cricket, yeah. right? There's no one philosophy that'll work. Right. It's just like... But that's about every kind of cricket, right? I don't Whatever. think so. And right now, they're just throwing anything at the wall. It's sticking and it's working. I don't think that's true for Test Cricket or ODI. It's pretty formulaic. That's why basketball didn't work in Test Cricket. It worked a little bit. It okay, did fine. Work. In one day, I feel like it all depends on your personnel. If you don't have... Like, I don't think you can expect Kohli to play in this system. Yeah. Because he's used to anchoring an innings. He'll take a good 30, 40 balls to make 50 runs. You know, he plays a little, but he plays according to what his team needs, right? He'll stay long if he has to. He'll let the other batsmen perform because he knows if he stays longer, more likely they're just saying win. Rohit did the same thing against CS. Okay, don't get personal. Yeah, I'm just that. saying, yeah. Okay. Yeah. But yeah, I, I mean, you are yeah. right. So yeah. I guess SRH has so you recruited played your players, was my point. those players hmm. and the mini auction was successful for them, uh, giving Pat Cummins the reins do whatever you want and lead our team to victory. He was a hundred crore, do whatever you do want. Do whatever you want. I mean, fair enough, as long as he's making the most of it. Um, it just pissed off a lot of Indians seeing Australians do well, especially after... Of course. Yeah, because I think this IPL has made me realize that our favorite pastime is hating on all these Australians who've just won the World Cup, earning the big bucks whenever they don't perform well. We love to hate on them. Whenever they do perform well, we don't know what to do. We're just like headless chickens just running around, <laughs> not knowing what to say. Uh, speaking of game plans and captains, we'll move on to Hardik Pandya and the Mumbai Indians. Um, that game was really entertaining just because... No, only because Dhoni walked out to bat, not only because Rohit <laughs> hit a century. But Sharma has gone to stop a boundary, which he did very successfully. And his pants have come off. You are a little gay for him. <laughs> fully, not little, fully. I mean, look at him. He, look at how he looks like and then look at how he performs. He's my captain, he's our captain. What do you mean by look at what he looks like? He looks great. Great. For yeah. a cricketer. Exactly. He's in shape. We don't want to get cancelled so fast with the first episode. Please, keep it on. He looks control. great. He looks great. There's he nothing wrong great. with saying that. No, 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 no. I thought you were going the other way. Or saying what you actually feel. But <laughs> this is good. Keep going. So he basically had the game of his life. He had a century and one fielding <laughs> that highlighted his whole last five years in the field. I'm just kidding. Actually, he's a very good slip fielder. His hands are quick and all. But they should actually keep him. Yeah, in they the should circle. keep him in the circle. But Captain Hardik, I also don't like to hate hate on him so much. He did yeah. very well for Mumbai. He's done good enough for India as well. He's come back. They've given him this role I to progress. I think people are being unfair. Yeah. Towards Indians him. like to hate on Australians. Indians like to hate on Indians and also. also. So anything that know. goes against them. And it's not him that has decided to become captain. There's a management in place. 
there are people there are there's a board that is deciding what is going to happen why something is going to happen and there's a entire succession plan so i don't understand why fans are directing their anger towards hardik and nothing is being said about mark boucher um or the ambani's or whoever is making these decisions you can't say i am so sorry i am so sorry i am so sorry i am so sorry we will edit that out yes i am so sorry but the board but mark boucher but mark boucher yeah, yeah. the Ma- mark boucher nobody else but either way it just looks like mumbai historically again they're slow starters they lose the first five games in the ipl and then win the whole season and it looks amazing it's been super fun being a mumbai fan all these years but this year it's, i thought it would be similar they lost dropped the first three then they won two at home and then again they lost in a pretty weird fashion where mumbai had the game in their hands just like they did in the first one against gujarat and then it just felt like pandya came into bat and then everything went south yeah so somehow somewhere he's just eating the blame and it's annoying to see mumbai fans booing him at the toss and everything mm-hmm. but also a little understandable at this point also a little funny it's hilarious the, great for content exactly the hardik chapri thing is very mean <laughs> very mean but it's also very funny it just sticks um so what i think with hardik is he's one of those characters that likes all the pressure i think eventually he will come out on top maybe not in this ipl maybe in the next or maybe in the t20 world cup that is if he gets selected that is if rohit sharma his his player decides to select him for the t20 world cup um but yeah i back him i support him he is the mumbai indians captain i am a mumbai indian fan so yeah i agree with that i back him i support him but it's funny and the content that's come off is it, yeah. pretty hysterical and yeah exactly so the winners from this game for me uh was the cricket media in general just yeah. clips deluxe from dhoni walking out dhoni hitting 20 runs and four balls the three sixes um on a more serious note shivam dubey as we've talking as we've been talking about hardik pandya's downfall we see shivam dubey slowly but surely rising through the ranks for the t20 squad um he's slowly cementing that spot for the fourth four down three down four down he's coming at two down so number 4 yeah number 4 um and i was a full hater of shivam dubey i thought he couldn't play a short ball for to save his life but this this season he's just done a full 180 he's smashing everything mumbai changed their entire strategy just to get him out when he was on strike they didn't let a spinner bowl even though one of the best bowlers was a spinner um they just let the pace bowlers bowl and they kind of fucked up in doing that because shivam dubey has adapted his game to kind of attack everything now in that case shivam yes. dubey is the reverse tim david cuz if piyush chawla has come into play <laughs> face pay uh, spinners yeah instead of an actual batsman that's They're paying this guy i think 10 12 crores I might be wrong but you're paying him a lot yeah. of money and he can't play spinners he can't even play pacers at this point. <laughs> yeah, and Rohit Sharma was another winner from this game finally getting to getting to see him get some big runs a century. He's been doing okay this season but getting a 100 is good to see especially after he lost captaincy and everything that's going on. Do you think that captaincy thing is um that players perform better when they're not captains? I I don't think that I think that's a blanket state. I think it applies and differs from player to player. Some mm-hmm. players do, I think Virat Kohli did. I don't know the stats on this, but I think Virat Kohli did towards the end of his season, end of his captaincy career. Mm-hmm. His performances started to dip a little bit, but I don't necessarily think it was because of the captaincy. What do you think? I'm not sure. It's not a concrete stat and Yeah. I haven't done enough research honestly on that. I just seen things yeah on X and all that stuff that, and commentators talking about that then oh now he has the freedom he doesn't have to captain the whole side yeah. so he can let loose on the crease. Mhm. So he's let loose on the thali. 
and eaten the vada pav <laughs> <laughs> but that was the argument for sachin too right when he was captain he wasn't performing yeah. well and once they relieved him of his captaincy duties he went back to his best and the pressure got relieved and he could then perform as he was doing before to wrap up cricket don't talk shit about sachin ever i would never okay. the ambani's and sachin please i would never please. do that i would never okay. do that so that's a wrap with cricket we'll move on to some football champions league is back and Ooh. banging we've had madrid and city two of the best teams arguably in the world right now they went head to head in the first leg in at the bernabeu it was 3 all and the level of the goals especially the last three two from city and the last one from madrid actually bernardo silva's was my favorite goal so i'll take that back it's just insane i mean the defending you can say hasn't been the greatest but with players like these on the pitch it's very hard to defend and when the pressure is on in a also champions league quarter final of what is of everything that's happening yeah it's super hard to be a defender and you know three all is a insane game what to stay up till midnight or 12:30 where it starts for us yeah that's exactly what i was going to say yeah. these games have been worth it have been so worth it and yeah so then there was the madrid city game then we had arsenal bayern which is just a classic staple in the round of 16 or quarter finals arsenal are bound to face bayern munich the few times they made it recently and they always get smashed but this time they were the emirates they took the lead and then the former player serge gnabry tied it up then bayern were kind of on the offense and then their arch nemesis harry kane from tottenham has gone to bayern and scored against arsenal all the narrative and all then, the narrative <laughs> so typical arsenal um before the game started i was talking to one of my friends who's also an arsenal supporter and i'm like watch watch gnabry score i said it as a joke you know thinking that if i say it out loud it won't happen you know one of those little dumb there i say ponoti yeah maybe i am in this in yeah. this situation yeah and then trossard equalized at the end and then exactly so now they have a game to play um at the allianz in germany do you have any predictions for Goal, that all um 4-0 harry kane all four goals bayern's going to win just okay. like that okay haha good joke yeah. um that's my official prediction okay and you want to bet on it? Harry you Kane all four goals. I can't. If you give me crazy odds, I will bet on it. No, no, no. Let's do. That's an outrageous a, take. Nah, it's a take. A, no, no, no. Let. It's a prediction. I asked you for a prediction. But so I'm not betting on predictions. Okay, so then say no. But if you give me odds, I will bet. I also burped right into the mic. So sorry to all the listeners. <laughs> but yeah. Um. Okay, so your. What is your prediction? I think Arsenal is going to lose three two. Three two. Yeah. You're that confident. Two goals, Arsenal will score. Yes, I am that confident. <laughs> yes, I am that confident. Good. Um, but yeah, I think we're gonna lose with that shitty ass team in twenty twelve, twenty eleven. Whenever we played them, we scored one goal. This team too can will be able to score two goals. Also, so, this is loser talk by me defending my team, predicting they're gonna lose and then defending that. But so I'm gonna stop. But yeah, you're doing that gonna lose three underestimation team. That yeah, my team sucks. And then if they win, yeah, you'll just totally come. You know, those, one of those people who like did. when they would go for exams and how did you do yeah. and they'd be like oh i don't know it wasn't that good we call and then them they end up doing like really well topping the class we call them women we oh my god <laughs> 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 but yeah it is usually them but i'm trying to use that um logic to arsenal mm-hmm. underestimating and then hopefully they pull out a victory but hopefully. they won't cuz they'll lose 3-2 hopefully, yeah. hopefully 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 And then we had a uh, PSG Barca. No, give me your before that before we move on give me your um predictions for Madrid City which okay, will happen so tonight. Okay, so I back that and then 3-1 Bayern is my prediction. 3-1 Bayern is your prediction. Okay. Kane one goal I will say. Okay. I can take that. And yeah. for the Madrid City game I'm going to go 2-1 to Madrid. 2-1 to Madrid. Yeah. Damn at the Etihad. At the Etihad. That is crazy. It's just Champions League Madrid just hits like that. I agree with you. I think Bellingham was kind of quiet in the first game. I think this game he's going to step up, and I would agree with that two one to Madrid. I think so too. Two at goals. At the Etihad. Two goals for Bellingham. 
And also, Pep cannot win a treble for the second time because then we'll actually have to create a European mm-hmm. Super League for him, specially. Because we'll jump out of the window of our house. Exactly. Of our exactly. That ball fuck cannot yeah. win again. Okay. Yeah. Um, you want to talk about Atletico yeah. Dortmund? So, Atletico Dortmund, actually, we watched both legs now by mm-hmm. the time of this recording. The first one, Atletico took 2 1 at home. They actually played pretty well. They had a bunch of chances. I thought they could have killed the tie right there. Um, but the like, biggest take for me as a United fan, the biggest fucking annoyance was Jaden yes. Sancho <laughs> playing in the Champions I was League. Bring that up. And playing okay. Like, he's not doing that well. Please, nobody come and tell any United fan that he's doing well because he's not. I watched the game. He made a mistake as well, which I was pretty happy about. And he's playing okay, but just the fact that he's playing in the Champions League as a lone player out of United is fucking annoying, especially how. Sh- how shit he was for the past two seasons for us. And yeah, that's my biggest takeaway from the first leg. I'll just give you guys the second leg score as well. It was 4-2. Dortmund actually took the tie, the game and the tie. And scoring four goals against Atletico is a steep task and they somehow managed to do it. I did notice there was a lot of mistakes in defence, especially from an uh, Atletico side, obviously there were four goals scored, but there was also that sweet header and then Dortmund also gave up a couple soft goals. Yeah, mm. I am just happy Atletico's eliminated. Um, I think they're one of the most boring sides to they, watch. Even though in the past few years they have changed the way they play, Diego Simeone has been under a lot of pressure from the fans, from the Atletico board, the recruiting style has changed. So yes, they have changed and that's why they probably conceded four goals this game. Right. But they are a very boring side to watch. They don't have any stars that stick out to me that I'd be like, hey, I want to go and watch. Griezmann. Except Griezmann, but he's also 30 now. He plays in midfield. He's not doing that. He's not doing what he's best at doing or what he used to do at one point. So yeah, I'm just glad because... When I watch Atletico, for me, the most entertaining bit is Simeone. His antics on the sideline. Side Him grabbing his balls. In this game, he was on the floor at one point. <laughs> yeah, Banging it like a child. Like, when they missed that why chance. Why not scoring? <laughs> uh, and, and also, like you said, they had so many chances, chances to kill the game. Alvaro, Alvaro Morata is doing the same thing that he's been doing for the past 10 years. Just getting the best possible chances and absolutely squandering them not stepping up when it actually matters. So, personally, I'm very glad. Dortmund also, overall, is a much better watch. Yeah, Atletico is a boring team to watch and they do a lot of diving and complaining as well. Because their whole strategy is, okay, we'll score one goal and then we'll keep wasting time and defend, defend, defend. That's what it's been previously. And it was fun in 2014 when it was something we hadn't seen around that time. And to do it against Madrid or to do it against the bigger teams and they were the underdogs. But now that they are one of the top dogs, now they've been there, done that, at that stage yeah. for a couple years now, for 10 years now. Last um, Champions League quarterfinal tie that we saw was uh, PSG Barca. First leg, 3 2 to Barcelona in Paris. Second leg, 4 1 to pa- PSG in Barcelona. That was such a fun tie. Like, Barcelona hasn't had the most success and the most. Like, fun times after Messi's left. They have two 17-year-olds playing and in now, the first 11. Yeah, it's been incredible this season. <laughs> like, they're not doing super well in La Liga. And they just got knocked out. I but, don't like watching the team. I feel so bad about myself. I'm like, what have I accomplished? Look at these 17-year-olds <laughs> just ripping it apart in the fucking Champions League. But 17, you're doing fine. You're still playing and all. But now what am I doing? Sitting and talking about them. But you're doing something. But we're doing something. So it's okay. Yeah. Don't you. feel bad. Thank you. Sweetie. Thank you. Thank you. And, um, but Men. either way, those 70 year olds it's incredible to see them do what they're doing. And two is insane. Normally there's one winger that just stands out or something at that age mm-hmm. and carries and stuff like that. But the ties was the uh, both the legs were really fun. In Paris, it was 2-1 to PSG and then Barca took it 3-2. Here in um, Barcelona, Araujo actually got a red card in the first, like, what, 10, 12? 4 1. PSG took it 4 1. 4 1 yeah. in the second leg. And um, Araujo got a red card super early in the match, which just tilted it in PSG's favor because if you lose a centre back, yeah. it's just not ideal. 
Xavi got pissed. Xavi. They, he, he also, also got, got a red, red card. card. Right. Yeah. And usually Barcelona, historically, in my experience, at least, I feel like the referees always favor Barcelona. So it's good to see Xavi getting pissed because in the press conference, he came out and said, it's a pity our Champions League is over due to the referee's mistake. I just told the referee he's been a disaster. It's the, it's the reality that I can't change the game. Which I agree with him. But, but it was happy. a red card. The it ref was... made other bad decisions in the game, definitely. I watched the game and he had some very weird calls, unnecessary yellow cards and stuff. And there were memes about it, like the ref just yeah. handing out yellows in that game. So I agree with that. But that's a red card. If you're the last man and if you just... If that guy's going to be one-on-one yeah. and you're going to foul him, it's a red card. You know what you're doing and then exactly. you can't just argue. And how can you buy the refs when the other team is a state-owned club? Right. How can you? How can you? How can you? Yeah. The Saudis. Um, um, sorry, sorry. Please. Yeah, I, not, nothing about them. I won't say anything. Sachin, Ambani, S- Saudis. Bus. Okay. We won't even talk. We won't talk. Uh, um, so, yeah, PSG is through and Dortmund is through so far. And we have two more legs to go. Like, we just two more um, teams to go through tonight. to the semi finals. And yeah. it's going to be super fun. And yeah, I'm really excited for the, how the Champions League season plays out. I fucking hope not that ball fuck Pep doesn't win. Yeah, man. no chance. Yeah. I mean, that's going to be... Everyone is just going to suck him off then yeah. and it's just going to be the same PR cycle. It's going to be very annoying. And we can't even special. deny that he's not great anymore. But I think that train had already passed last year. Yeah, he started coaching Messi meaning he's great. Okay. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about the Premier League. Premier League... Yeah. What is happening in the Premier League? Arsenal is going to win the league. United is going to win the league? No. United is going to qualify for the Champions League? No. United is going to probably have their worst possible finish in Maybe. the history of the Premier League? Maybe. Okay. But at least I'm honest about it. I, did I Two say... Two weeks ago, This you entire told year, have I ever said even once... Last that year? That we are going to win... And two weeks that ago... That we are going to win the Premier League. You said it to my face. That never, never. Arsenal I is going to win. I am the most pessimistic human on this planet. Not when it comes to... when it comes to Arsenal. No. Yes. No. Yes. No. Next time I say it, record my face. And then you can put a clip. I will. And then prove me wrong. But I will. I really don't... I really don't remember saying that Arsenal is going to win the league. No, I made it up. Yeah. You <laughs> so the other up. Arsenal fans. <laughs> the delusions. Yeah, they are delusional. Yeah. I agree with you. Arsenal fans. I love Arsenal fans. I love Arsenal, but sometimes the Arsenal fans can yeah. get delusional, can get a little annoying. But yeah, so Arsenal and Liverpool, they were first and second. Actually, Liverpool was first and Arsenal was second. Liverpool drop points. And Liverpool drop points to Crystal Palace at Anfield. They Adam. lost 1 0. Yeah. And then Arsenal lost at the Emirates. They lost to Good Evening, Unai Emery, 2 0. So that was super fun for me to watch Came because to watching us. my team has not been fun at all. And then it City. It can't be fun. It can't. Conceding 80 goals against your. 80 shots against your biggest rivals in over three to four fixtures. Four fixtures. They played Liverpool four times, conceded 80, eight, around 80 shots. Last game was a tie, so How sad. a win. Okay. I mean, as long as you're happy, is that's all I'm my concern. Happy. Oh, okay. I'm as just trying to make... Well, not overwhelmed, not underwhelmed. <laughs> well. Yeah. Trying to make a little light out of a shit situation, yeah. so let me have... But either way, City won 5-1, so now, as usual, they're first in the league with six. Eight games to go? No, six games to go. Six games to go. Six games to go. They're just like clockwork, man. It's the business end of the season. Kind of cliche, but it gets there and they're like, okay, we need to win, we need to win, we need to win. Yeah. And they do it. All of a sudden, all their injuries also disappear. Exactly. They just disappear. Everything just falls into place. Other teams start shitting the bed. Yeah. Start choking. Not that I think Arsenal choked, but they they were pulled it. They did. They will. But... You know, yeah, it was like, I don't want to make this about me, but Liverpool lost and then I got a little cocky. I was like, oh shit, yes, they've dropped points. So, how can you say that I'm a pessimist and get cocky and confident at the same time? I know, I know. I'm Looking back now, I'm saying that was incorrect of me. That was out of my nature. That was not what I would typically do. Mm. So, I texted one of our friends saying, ha 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 ha, Liverpool lost. Um... A repeat of the 13-14 season when they fucked it up against Palace. Hmm. 
um and then we fucked it up and then i couldn't help but think that this is all my doing go into that depression hole that arsenal sucks i suck why do i do this why do i behave like this that's all true see now i want you to hype me up a little bit <laughs> and you're doing all this shit but yeah i just club was just so frustrating man it just always at the cusp of achieving something and then taking my hopes destroying them and then burying them 6 feet under so yeah i don't think arsenal is going to win we probably not going to win the champions league either we probably going to finish second or third and we go again next season um are you happy with arteta and his progress I five years really. a lot of money spent one fa cup i am really happy because the position in which we were before was really bad i don't think people on the outside realize how bad of a situation the club was in um if to put it in to put it in context if arteta left hmm. tomorrow i think he's built a structure good enough for another manager to come in and take over and probably do well with which we didn't have when wenger left and when emery left um he's done good recruiting he set up a good system a good philosophy he's brought the fans back in um creating a culture around the club a sense of belief where we're going against the biggest teams and getting some points winning and competing in the top 3 to 4 um which is obviously not exactly what i want for my club but it's better than finishing 7th and 8th and we finish 6th also sometimes and struggling against the bottom half of the table no i agree i would be all jokes aside i'd be very happy with arteta as my manager although and he says all the right things he looks so good but i would say that he has been very good for the club and he as an not an arsenal fan he is annoying with his antics and stuff but he's done very well for the but club but love that about him that. because when yeah, they do that it's like like a player like luis suarez exactly you want him on your team you love him to death exactly. but you hate him if yeah. you're playing against him yeah um so to wrap up liverpool and their struggles we had them winning the quadruple last month <laughs> <laughs> they won they have the efl still efl still yeah efl they got knocked out against united in the fa cup Atlanta Three destroyed nil. them but it's like set up for a classic yeah, comeback yeah it is it there is. i see for Klopp. and i'd love to see it yeah yeah <laughs> i'd love to see it uh but also i'm turning on clock now he's like he's doing his retirement tour i love him i love the style of his play everything but he just he treats the media like shit he does whatever he wants to he plays all these mind games in the press conference he played it with arteta he was like if united play against mm-hmm. this is when both the teams were in the title race when and united had just played them he said if united play like this against arsenal they lose for sure I'm like what are you trying to say just like talk about your team and chill out mind games i enjoy but i do also enjoy but that he has that persona of like oh i'm like a nice guy a nice guy yeah. i all i do is hug players and and hug other managers and and yeah i would never dare say a bad thing about anybody and fist bump to the crowd and thank them when we lose and also exactly. don't play the nice guy when and you want then, to yeah exactly like a mourinho he knows mourinho, yeah he knows I'm we gonna... know everyone know the media knows yeah there is no two ways about it so essentially liverpool's quadruple has become a maybe efl a maybe an efl yeah i may be uh yeah maybe an efl and for united fan that's always good i'm sure you're happy about that as well even though i respect klopp his football is very entertaining but yeah that's going to be you want to talk fun. about united or no. fuck it no not thanks. worth it not important no thanks no thanks okay um history was made history in the bundesliga was made. history was made and history repeated itself yet again with it did. the great harry kane who has still not won a professional title in his entire career of course which, which is was insane it's very hard. to say but the caliber of the player yeah he is so good he's been so good he went to bayern who's won the past 11 years 11 years and maybe <laughs> 19 out of 20 i don't know exactly yeah bundesliga yeah. and then he goes there and bayer leverkusen with xavi alonso as their manager in that 
entire club's history 125 years or yes. 120 on 20 years. years or something yeah. won the bundesliga with six games to spare what a story what a story yeah. but i feel so bad and it's so funny at the so same funny. time so funny i bet you're loving it and yeah i mean if harry kane was sitting here i'd probably point at him and laugh at him and be like ha 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 but also be like dude i feel bad for you you're a great player but ha 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 Okay. It is a little funny, <laughs> like that you didn't win. After Harry Kane's all. coming on next week, guys. Just yeah. Tune in. Um, but yeah, the scenes from they played. I think they played Werder Bremen, uh, Leverkusen this past weekend. They won five mm-hmm. nil. Uh, Wurtz scored the fourth goal. The scenes were absolutely insane. As soon as he scored the fourth goal, he starts celebrating. The crowd goes crazy. People are falling all over onto the pitch. He's like, stop, stop, stop. Go back, go back. He has to like stop celebrating. And he's like this 20-year-old dude who's just like made all these 30-year-olds come and they're all falling onto the pitch. <laughs> it was just a very funny scene where he's like, go back, go back. We'll celebrate later. But it was too late. It was the 83rd minute. People were running on the pitch. They had to stop it, send them back. And then they scored another goal. And then as soon as the full-time whistle was blown, Everyone just rushed the pitch. It was insane. The players were there, and scenes from the German league are so funny with that beer. Exactly, what well, I was gonna say. With that beer glasses uh, on each other, drenching the manager, drenching each other. P- players are just drunk out of their mind. Everyone is Jack Grealish at that point. Um, but yeah, the celebration when you win any German cup is so much fun so to much even fun. watch. So much fun. It's like holy with beer. Like they just have pictures and they're just throwing it that on is everyone. So true. Yeah. Their manager, everyone's getting drenched. And it's just such a good vibe. Yeah. And they still have like it's funny because I don't know if players do this usually, just get pissed drunk. Because if Bayern wins, for example, with three games to go, they still have a Champions League semi final quarter or a final to play. So is it good? Or not, but it's good for the vibes, so it we is, love it. Yeah, <laughs> it's probably yeah because that's been the argument, right? Yeah. For Bayern, that they win everything before get drunk as fuck, yeah, and then they cannot perform in the Champions League when it matters the most. Exactly. And they haven't been able to. And it's funny how America does it with the fucking Gatorade yeah. thing. <laughs> they drench their uh, head coach or whatever. In the NFL, it is funny because it's really cold, and yeah. they do that. Yeah. But um, yeah, the celebrations is so much fun to watch. Yeah. In any German um. And Xabi cup. Alonso, and they're still unbeaten. Yeah. They're still unbeaten. Xabi Alonso's first season, full season as a manager. Uh, it's just absolutely killing it. Yeah. That's a wrap on football, and then we'll move on to the most important sporting event that happened this past weekend, which was UFC 300. Absolutely amazing card, top to bottom. We Fire had. Card. Fire card. We had 11 champions, uh, former champions fight on that card. Um, the first fight was Cody Garbrandt against Davison Figueredo, both champions. There was a finish in that and then the, the night just took off. Dana White promised us that he's going to deliver on this, his, this, I mean, 300, whatever you want to call it. It's the Dana daddy. Yeah. <laughs> Dana daddy has taken it home with this. And then since the first fight, like I was saying, it just went off. Diego Lopez had a finish, Kayla Harrison had a finish. There were entertaining fights. Um, we we'll just talk about the last three mainly. We had um, Weili Zhang and Yan Zhaonan, who made history as the first two women from China to compete for a UFC title. And that was actually the co-main event. That was a super high level technical fight. There was interesting things happened. And I thought the most interesting thing in that was when at the end of one of the rounds, I think it was round one or round two, uh, Whaley choked out Jan and she actually choked her out. But Jan made it to her corner and she just stumbled in. And then I think the corner gave her a smelling salt to wake her up. And then after that... And Joe Rogan was like, I don't think that's allowed. Yeah. I don't think that's allowed. <laughs> but... He does smelling salts every week. You know? <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> Before a podcast. So yeah. Technically, we should have seen how yeah. successful Dioric. he is. We should incorporate that in our next episode. Next time, I'll try to figure out some smelling salts. But either way, that was such an interesting thing because it's never happened before. There's been so many fights and events and so many 
different promotions or everything but never has someone been choked out walked back to his or her corner and then got us woken up by smelling salt but then she fought very well after that <laughs> as well even though she lost the entire yeah. fight it was her first time in a championship fight like that big stage UFC 300 representing a country and making history everywhere and yan chanan has fought a fantastic fight against probably pound for pound right now the best female fighter which is weili jan mm-hmm. and that was such a high level fight and a, a very entertaining fight as well but because of what happened in the fight before people aren't talking about it as much but if you have any thoughts on that please on that share. fight no i don't really have any thoughts on that i to be honest i completely blacked out for that fight <laughs> after what happened uh in the fight before that i had i remember her getting choked out i remember smelling salts but i have no clue how that fight ended or who won uh i'm just finding out right now um but yeah so all i really want to talk about is the fight before is that racist that you don't know who won that the fight that is not racist maybe sexist not racist uh but oh i i get i see what you're getting at yeah no i know i know who weili jang is and i know who yan jang and is i am not racist maybe sexist but continuing um uh, justin gaethje versus max holloway yeah so max holloway is my favorite fighter of all time what performances he he's put up historically he's his output he's always moving forward trying to get the finish talking shit emoting he's so cool before and after the fight that i just love the guy and i thought he was going to lose honestly this fight he's moved up one weight class to fight the scariest guy on the entire roster one of at least the baddest motherfucker at the time justin gaethje who's just coming off of an amazing performance against Chandler followed by Fiziev and then Dustin Poirier who he head kicked into oblivion Max Holloway has been calling for this fight for about 3 to 4 months at least i would say he got his wish at UFC 300 biggest card ever he been saying you guys don't know what i'm going to do you guys have no confidence in me but see i'm different like I prepared. I know what I'm talking about. I'm going to put put that weight on correctly because he fought previously at 155 and he looked very like he just looked out of shape. Like DC was saying he looked like a bag of potatoes. DC is saying a 155 pounder <laughs> is looking like a bag of potatoes. So that's how it was. Yeah. The and, bag of potatoes is saying yeah. that someone else is looking like a bag of right. potatoes. So then He puts on that weight perfectly. He looks great during the weigh-ins, photo shoots, and everything throughout fight week. He's super confident. He's saying, "Just see, I respect Gaethje. Um, he has the power. He has the skills. But I'm gonna come out on top." He's he was saying that the whole time, every interview. And then the fight starts. He's looking fast. He's looking sharp. He's looking crisp. He's looking calm. He's, he's looking, looking calm. so calm. Right. He looks like he just belongs. He knows yeah. what he's doing. He gets he. his leg his front leg eaten by those leg kicks which is a gechi classic he just gets in smashes you with that leg kick and then he does work with his hands with the hooks and uppercuts and then sometimes he uses jab and the end of the first so he dominated in the first round and we are all shocked we're like fuck yeah it's going to go to plan at least the max fans yeah and everyone's like okay max has definitely taken that round towards the end of the round he landed that spin kick right on gechi's nose and broke his most most likely broke if not just busted really bad i saw a clip where they were talking about that max had been working on that spin kick yeah so he was saying that he worked on it because gechi because he throws those leg kicks or whatever his combinations he tends to linger in that position little crouch down and if he can get him with his hands not in the right place he could do some damage so he landed that kick once and he did serious damage to it imagine breaking your nose in the first fight and fighting four rounds that's why gechi is also a fucking monster. Yeah. So I'm just getting goosebumps yeah. <laughs> as you're saying that cuz his nose is broken, blood is just pouring just down. Just non-stop. Yeah. His corners like don't blow your nose otherwise your eyes will shut. So he lands that, breaks his nose and then he lands it six more times, eight more times <laughs> too in the whole fight. And but that obviously set him up to continue what he did in the first round as being the faster guy trying to stay away. He okay, he paid the price. He might not be able to walk. the day after or the night off of the fight but he was just so fast he was in and out he was dominating he was touching gechi everywhere 
Um, Gechi, in fact, in I think the fourth round, he sat Max down. I, I thought it was a knockdown at the time, but officially it didn't count as a knockdown. So Max is the only fighter in UFC history to not have an official knockdown oh, so against him. It wasn't? Him. It wasn't. Because oh. he was down for like a split second and then he got up. Okay, that's fishy. I found that out the next day or whatever. Okay. Fishy, but I'm for it. Yeah. And then round five comes in. Max almost gets a finish. He takes into he um, what do you call it? he stumbles Gechi. Yeah. Takes into the fence, hits him some body shots. Then he backs off because obviously something's going to come back. And at this point, Max has been comfortably winning. Clean sweep. It's three one. Uh, sorry, it's four one at worst. Yeah. If not, worst. he's won all five rounds. Yeah. Then we are, then we hear the ten second clicker, and then Max w- does what he had done before against uh, Lamas. He points to the center, he's like, come, Justin Gaethje. Imagine being that kind of a psycho. Come, Justin Gaethje, come to the center, and let's just bang it up. He's risking his victory at this point. He's risking his victory. He doesn't give a fuck. He just wants that 300k bonus. Yeah. No doubt. Yeah, 100%. And no respect, man. Get that red. And he wants to put up a fight. Right. So he points to the center of the octagon. They're going. They're just throwing aimlessly, it seems like. Then the pocket just exchanging hooks, body shots, whatever. And then bang, Max lands at 4 minutes 59 seconds of round 5 and Gechi is face down asleep. Last second, last punch, knockout. I mean, the reaction of everyone at our viewing party or whatever you want to call it, the reaction of everyone everywhere around the world, there's been so many videos out. Reaction of the commentators, other fighters. Joe Rogan getting up. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it was just the greatest finish to a fight that I've ever seen. Like, just dominating five rounds and then doing that against a guy like Justin Gaethje, who's so tough, so good. It's just insane. And he was right the whole week, man. He's built different. Holloway celebrating. I'm so happy for him. I forgot to mention, like you said, the bonuses in the UFC are normally 50,000 for performance and fight of the night. But this fight, because it was such a special event UFC 300 the biggest event they've ever put on they made the Dana White made the bonuses to 300,000 so Max ended up taking 300,000 for the knockout performance of the night and Max and Gaethje took 300,000 each for fight of the night well deserved BMF fight baddest motherfucker Holloway I mean that was just the grace I was screaming when they were exchanging the punches and then I was just silent and just running around Yeah. when he put him to sleep. I mean, <laughs> that was just so much fun because it's so hard for people like us to watch fights. It's a dedication, man. It's a dedication. Waking up at 3 a.m. Yeah, and if you know how Sammy drinks, like, to wake up I at had, 8 a.m. I had zero beers <laughs> the night before and that morning it was Tanai at 3 a.m. who had two beers in his hand ready to go. Drinking till 10 a.m., drunk as fuck, before anyone else had even woken up. Nothing was going to put me to way. sleep. That yeah. it was. I mean, this we know is some people who slept though. Yeah, to a couple we do, fights. We do, yeah, yeah, who claim to be yeah. <laughs> UFC experts. <laughs> <laughs> some some people. Some do people. That. They they might or might not also have a podcast, but yeah, let's keep that under wraps. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, it was just the greatest performance, the greatest, I don't know, it's something about that feeling you get in these fights. I mean, I was pretty upset that my other favorite fighter, Charles Oliveira, lost a close fight. Yeah, I was going to bring that up, you casually just... It was a close fight and he lost and it's okay. It It was so funny to see you shitting your pants (laughs) when that fight was going on. Uh, Usually Tanai doesn't get nervous, he's pretty level-headed, he just does what he does. But when Charles Oliveira fights, he just becomes another human. It's like he's about to shit himself. Uh, anything you say sets him off. Uh, I almost feel like he shouldn't watch these fights because he gets he becomes someone else, and it's so much fun triggering him. Uh, <laughs> and then eventually watching Oliveira lose, even though I like Oliveira, it's just fun to see him go through that. Yeah, so when Oliver and Max fight, I get super nervous. So our McDonald's actually came during that time. I didn't eat anything for the next half an hour yeah. until those fights were basically <laughs> done. I just couldn't. Like, that's how it gets during these fights. But I was going to ask you, so you don't watch obviously as many fights as I do. I mean, I work in the industry and stuff. Shut so, up. Sorry. Shut up. 
so you what job? makes you you don't do this full time <laughs> what makes you come and join us at 5 am or whatever time you came at and watch these fights um that's a good question in general i just love watching sports and if there are five people watching a sport together enjoying it and willingly giving me context to what is happening i am there i'm going to watch it just that idea of like being around people enjoying the same thing a live event but the ufc is something special in itself because literally anything can happen uh, mma this at any point mma the mma in general anything can happen at any point a fighter could be absolutely shitting the bed losing the fight but one straight punch could then go out to knock the other guy out right and there is something so visceral and scary about seeing the lights go off uh in a fighter where you almost don't want to look but you can't help but look and then see that clip 300 times <laughs> once you get back home yeah i mean if rohan is responding to my instagram story about the fight then some that means something insane has something happened something insane has yeah, happened yeah something like, insane has happened three of like people know i'm interested in the ufc three four other people who have never watched you a ufc fight or mma fight in their life um uh texting me like that ufc card was crazy right i'm like yeah dude did you see the clips that have been going viral and yeah that just shows the impact that this card had and again i am not as much into the ufc as you are so when i initially saw this card i was like okay it's a good card the main card i was like but it's not a ufc 300 card for me hmm. now i do not have that much context into a uh, bonicle i do not have that much context into um the aweli jam like we said before um so it wasn't that exciting just on paper but when the fights did happen every fight delivered especially the holloway gechi fight it was like a movie man you couldn't script that to be any better it was yeah. almost like amit shah is running the ufc <laughs> <laughs> well, Dana White is the Amit Shah of the US. In many ways, yeah. Yes. But yeah, it is something about fighting that if anything is going on, for example, in your school, like you're playing cricket, there's football. Sorry, Jai Shah, not Amit Shah, but continue. Oh my! We see the president. Come on. I know. Yeah. That was bad. From yeah. Both of us. Both of us. Yeah. But if anything is going on, I'm at lunch break in your school, like you're playing cricket, football, whatever. But if there's a fight. People Everyone's will gonna end watch. up at the fight. Everyone's gonna watch, and that's why it's the most entertaining thing. Sport, like I love football. That's the first sport I started watching. Cricket, I watched tennis, and I watch a bunch of sports. Even when I was in America, I watched basketball and everything as well. But when it comes to that fight feeling, even on the roads different. over here, yeah. people stop what they're doing, <laughs> and there'll be three hundred people. Just they make their own <laughs> ring, the natural UFC <laughs> cage. they're watching they're not uh, stopping it they're not stopping yeah. it there's especially with <laughs> three judges on the side you know <laughs> and ready to score it but you're so right yeah a fight happens everyone yeah. has to stop and, and watch and attend the fight yeah. and this is the peak of that i mean you get fights like this you get finishers up and down the card you get elite fighters ranked fighters champions former champions fighting i mean there's nothing else to watch that's why like it then becomes a little easier to wake up it depends what you're watching 3 a.m. 5 a.m. or yeah. 8 a.m. then you wake up and you want to watch those pay-per-views with your friends is even better exactly and it just it, multiplies the especially when it's 10 of us and 7 of us are experts like you <laughs> want to be you want to be in that room <laughs> uh, um but, but no for me it's an like it's a trade off like okay i'm going to wake up is this card going to be worth it and Sometimes a card is not worth waking up for, and it's for you. It doesn't work like that, of course. It's mostly pretty rewarding, especially when it is in America. I used to wake up at seven a.m. to watch United play <laughs> to a zero-zero draw against uh, Fulham or whatever team. Yeah, and that was like the worst experience ever. Yeah, like it's it was so sad. Like in college, just putting on my laptop like that and placing it and as watching a game to, like that, as opposed to fifteen fights. 
Yeah. Any of them could be show stopping, have a crazy knockout, something that you've probably never seen before, pulling out different moves. Yeah, I mean, and that 300 they were hyping it up so much it delivered. And we're yet to talk about the main event. Yes. Main event was Alex Pereira against Jamal another, Hill. Another bad motherfucker. Yeah, another scary, scary guy. He's fought less than 10 times. I think he's fought 8 times in the UFC. He's had 2 belts. He's beat 5 former champions. He's knocked out, I think, 5 6 out of 8 fights. He's had knockout victories in. And I don't think he knows how to wrestle. And he's made it. So he's, he but he was, got a jiu-jitsu belt? Yeah. <laughs> that was... First off, I never understood that. But before that, I'll say he's come from glory kickboxing. And he was elite of the elite. He was, I think, a two-division champion there as well, simultaneously. He's knocked out a lot of elite kickboxers and that's what made him the best. And then he transitioned to MMA. He fought some low-level, uh, I mean, regional fights and everything in Brazil and then... So, Glory is better than the UFC? No. Okay. No. Um, <laughs> And then he, his basically his whole uh, UFC path was to chase Adesanya for the 185 middleweight championship. And Who Izzy, he had fought in the previous. Yes. So Izzy was in glory as well, and Pereira was, had knocked him out in glory. Yes. And then Izzy one time said in an interview that yeah, this guy is just going to say that I knocked him out once. And gonna you be know, sitting at a bar. Exactly. He's gonna get drunk and he's gonna be a loser, basically he called him. And I'm the winner in this situation. Turns out Pereira switched spots. He beat three, four contenders, got the easy fight, won by TKO, and he mission accomplished, but then he gave Izzy a rematch, which was deserved because Izzy had won six championship fights in a row at that point, six, yeah. seven. Then Izzy got the best of him once. So technically the score was three one. Two mm -hmm. kickboxing fights. Two UFC fights. Uh, two UFC fights and the total was 3-1 to Pereira. But then Pereira went up to 205, which is lightweight. He beat the guy Izzy couldn't beat. He got a title shot, won the title, defended his title. So I think he's laughed him a little bit. Um, and once again, I'll say, I don't think he knows how to wrestle or anything. He got his jiu-jitsu black belt off of a first round knockout. <laughs> I mean, Grover Teixeira and his team are fantastic. Great team. They've been, they've had champions. They've established a great gym in Connecticut. But what the fuck are you giving him a black belt for after a first round knockout in Jiu Jitsu, I think? I don't think it was a Taekwondo black belt or anything. I don't know what it was. It, it looked I think like it was a Jiu Jitsu, jiu -jitsu yeah. black belt with the red stripe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think it was a Jiu Jitsu belt. But even I was shocked. I was like, I have never seen this guy wrestle ever. Yeah. I've seen a bunch of his knock knockouts, but never actually on the mat. But he, he shouldn't, right? Play to your strengths. His wrestling is defense wrestling. 100%, but it was just a but random move. it's not great. Move. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, in his weight class, I don't... Do you think there's anyone who could challenge him on the floor, like on the mat? Uncle, Magomed Ankalai, which should... Okay. If he stays at 205, he should fight 205 Magomed is, is light, light heavyweight. heavyweight. Yes. So basically what happened in the Jamal Hill fight with Alex Pereira was... It was actually a great sequence. So yeah. I'll just give some backstory of the week. Jamal Hill was super confident and boastful. He's like, I'm not scared. I'm going to stand with this guy. People say he hits hard. I hit hard. How can you do so much trash talk with that Mickey Mouse tattoo <laughs> on your chest? This guy has two thumbs ups on his chest of like Mickey Mouse's hands. I you don't, don't think that's cool or no, no, I think it's damn cool. <laughs> I respect him so much when I see that. Yeah. But what is that? Like, what does it even mean? Whenever, whenever he, like, spoke or he was catching Pereira's arrows and breaking them, I couldn't help but just look at that. I'm like... So oh. you like staring at men's tits? In this instance, maybe, yeah. Man. <laughs> They're pretty sexy. <laughs> but yeah, so it was round one. They were feeling each other out, gauging range or whatever fancy term you want to use. And then accidentally, Jamal had a crotch shot on um, Pereira. And then Herb Dean, the ref, came in to stop the fight, asked him if he needed a break or whatever. That was so bad. And Pereira was just like, yo, stay the fuck away. Yeah, I'm in my zone. I'm in the zone. Yeah, don't mess this Five up. Five seconds cooking. later, Jamal is unconscious. He's <laughs> getting hammer fisted on the ground. We have, the champion has retained his belt. And we're back to um, Chama season. Chama. And yeah, and then in, the, in his post-fight interview, he says he might want to move up to uh, heavyweight and 
who I wants to fight and he really wants to get on the UFC 301 card which is in Brazil it's a little um it's lacking elite fighters or entertaining fighters fighters so, that I would know yeah of. fighters that you you might know two out of yeah then like this one you probably know 7 8 out of 10 yeah. right so it's lacking that strength that a pay per view card should have and they're going to a different location in Brazil he's Brazilian he's like I love to go back I love to go to heavyweight and i think fuck it give him whatever he wants bro he's At done point, so well yeah. he carried ufc 300 obviously on the night it was max but all week it was about the main event as well and he accepted the fights he's beaten everyone he had a first round knockout and he didn't even get performance of the night because yeah. there was so much other shit crazy cool shit yeah. on any other night he probably yeah, would have easily would have yeah. a two and a half three minute knockout is a yeah. guaranteed what else do you want from a fighter exactly. you're untouched you're not injured or hurt anywhere yeah. he landed two punches on you maybe a couple of kicks he touched your dick but like otherwise <laughs> he had no scratches and he came out and he's just the coolest fucking guy ever bro like he is. we can't even he can't even speak english and everyone relates to him it's like him and olivera like they don't speak english translator comes and the crowd just goes insane yeah i don't know what it is about the brazilian fighters yeah uh, they just some have- of them yeah Yeah but especially these two they just have some kind of gravitas that like I'll tell you what I like so what people like about Oliveira is his story he came from absolutely nothing I think so did Alex but Oliveira lost he was 50-50 in his first um like 10th fight yeah in like his first 15 16 so he was like 10 and 8 or something in the UFC then he wins to he went in, in a row shit. with 11 finishes and yeah. he gets the belt so Everyone loves an underdog story and he and had the vibe. His interviews yeah, yeah, yeah. are so good. He like comes off as so real. Yeah, and so chill and all that so stuff. So chill yeah. and he's genuinely thankful and grateful right. for everything that has happened in his life. So people like to relate and that's yeah. easy. I think with Pereira it is that he is so stone cold and such a killer when he's fighting. And otherwise he's such a like a prankster. He's a low key like he's doing like things that children would do you think yeah. like he's whacking his coach on the head he's scaring his like whatever girlfriend and stuff yeah. he's playing pranks at the airport and stuff so that's why it's so funny that a guy like him who's so scary who looks like what he looks like who fights like how he fights can also be lighthearted mm-hmm. and just understand the vibe of you know basically humans that yeah you want to fuck around at the end of the day yeah. you know like when i'm sure in training and all he must not be fun to hang out with mm-hmm. or to spar against or anything but I mean he shouldn't be. Right? Yeah, in front of the cameras without speaking English to have so many fans to headline the biggest card ever. I mean, yeah. It's incredible. I mean, yeah, the UFC has its next star. Yeah. For them and hopefully he makes that move to heavyweight. Yeah. There are some very interesting opponents waiting there for him. And maybe we can then see his jiu-jitsu. <laughs> his black belt to be. Band. <laughs> in play yeah. but yeah overall great ufc card what a fun night what um, a fun morning yeah morning <laughs> what a fun morning very very worth waking up for uh, staying up watching these fights i mean yeah an a plus card um yeah i watched the max holloway knockout on repeat yeah from all, all kinds the of different angles, angles. Yeah. the perera on repeat Um, yeah, just some bad motherfuckers and yeah, I mean, it was so much an fun. An awesome, awesome night. So yeah, that's about it. First episode done. Congratulations.